Welcome everyone to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar, Grasses That Bloom in the Spring with Lauren Brown. I'm Ann DeNovo, I'll be your host. Our speaker this evening will be Lauren Brown, the author of Grasses, Sedges and Rushes, an Identification Guide. And you see the cover of her book on the first slide there. Lauren Brown grew up in Connecticut at a time when children roamed freely outdoors and thus she developed a deep love of nature and the outdoors. She has a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College and a master's degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She has held positions at various conservation organizations and taught plant identification at several venues. Her lifelong interest in botany was paralleled by a strong interest in languages, which led her also to teach adult English to speakers of other languages for several years. In addition, she, uh, for many years, she has been active with her local land trust in Connecticut and with the Connecticut Botanical Society. Her first publication was a book called Weeds and Wildflowers in Winter, originally titled Weeds in Winter, which was a guide to identifying the dried skeletons of plants that persist through the winter time. This publication was followed in 1979 by Grasses, an identification guide published by Houghton Mifflin. In 2020, the Yale University Press published a revised and updated edition of this book, which she co-authored with Ted Elliman, titled Grasses, Sedges, and Rushes, an Identification Guide. The main premise of both editions is that many grasses, and also their lookalikes, the sedges and rushes, can be identified using naked eye characteristics and everyday vocabulary. So for the beginner, it is not necessary to learn specialized terms and depend on magnification to see tiny flower parts. And with that, Lauren, now I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Anne. Um, last fall, you all were treated to a fantastic talk by Kevin Dodge of your Western Maryland chapter called Grasses for Dummies Like the Rest of Us. Step by step, Kevin walked you through the process of beginning grass identification using my book. He taught you the key, taught you how to use the key, and explained the terminology. For tonight, I figured there was no point in repeating what Kevin did, especially since his talk was recorded but I wanna build on his presentation by giving you a little boost. This will still be introductory, but I'm gonna give you a little boost and show you how to recognize the common grass species that you can expect to see in the upcoming month. That way, if you go out in the next few weeks and encounter some grasses, you'll have a little list in your head that will give you a head start by narrowing down your choices. You might call this cheating. It's like getting the answers to the quiz before you even take it, but take advantage of it. And while I do this, I'm also going to talk about the basic techniques of identifying grasses. I'll talk about terminology and talk about what you should look for. When I started preparing this talk, I was immediately confronted with a problem. I live in Connecticut. I have spent some time in Maryland, but mainly on the Eastern shore because my father grew up there. But I still go down occasionally to visit family in the town of Snow Hill which by the way is a charming historic town on the banks of the Pocomoke River and I hope you'll visit it someday. But these visits rarely allowed much time for botanizing. Plus I think their flora is a little different from yours in the Piedmont. So I realized I might, might not know your grass flora well enough to talk about it. Marnie Bruce, your program coordinator, connected me with Sarah Tangren, who also gave you an excellent talk last fall. And she helped me with my species selection. So I want to take this opportunity to thank her, but stress, as all authors do, that any errors or omissions are my responsibility alone. One of the main premises of my book is that grasses can be told one from another, often on the basis of really simple, obvious characteristics. One of those is seasonality. Where I am up here in Connecticut, 
there's a whole cohort of grasses that flowers and appears in late mid to late May. It might be earlier for you, they might even be flowering now. These species are among those that we call the cool season grasses. Cool season grasses are species that make their best growth and flower when the weather is cool and damp. They can be native or non-native, but here in our highly disturbed megalopolis environment, the ones that you see all the time are gonna be non-native. And that's no coincidence. They're mainly native to Northern Europe and they were brought here by the early settlers to be planted as forage for their livestock. They found our disturbed environments to their liking and they quickly spread beyond the cow pasture. And I, I hate to say this given the name of your society, but every single species that I'm gonna show you tonight is going to be non-native, and some of them in certain cases quite invasive. By coincidence, these early spring grasses or spring grasses are among the hardest to identify. So once you get a handle on these, you'll have early, easier sailing for the rest of the season. There are a lot of books out there on grass identification, and they're all excellent, but they're all what we call technical. They follow the taxonomically correct method of identification, which is to rely on the characteristics of the flowers. And this is the time to make sure that you do all know that grasses do have flowers. They could be considered wildflowers. They grow wild and they have flowers. But the difference is that the flowers are drab and tiny and they have specialized structures which have given rise to specialized terms. These factors, the tininess and the specialized vocabulary intimidate a lot of people. But this terror is not necessary because as I said before, you can distinguish a lot of them based on naked eye differences, which can be described in plain English. Those naked eye plain English characteristics are what this talk will focus on tonight, but we're going to dip our toes as well into the technical aspects because you'll need to understand these terms sooner or later and some of you might be eager to learn them. A few terms before we actually start looking at grasses. This is one of the most important terms you need to learn, inflorescence. You probably know this already because you use it when you identify the quote unquote other wildflowers. It refers to the entire assemblage of flowers. These little dots are flowers or flower clusters. Here they're all mushed together. It's the entire assemblage of flowers often referred to as the seed head, which is a perfectly acceptable term. Here are some live inflorescences. It starts here, goes up to here, up to the top. You'll find out later what these plants are. Here are the inflorescences on this one, starting here, going up here, starting here, going up here. There are several types of inflorescences in the flowering plants, but the two that you'll see the most often in the grass family are these two, panicles and spikes. What's the difference? It's pretty obvious. The panicle has a lot of branches. Again, here are the flowers at the end of the branches. And the spike, you can't see the individual flowers because they're all clumped together, but they're, they have no stalks. They're attached directly to the stem on a vertical axis. That's the definition of a spike. These drawings are a little oversimplified. When we see some live ones, you'll see that there are even more branches than this. And the important thing to remember about a panicle is that there's a lot of compound branching. It's not just one, one stalk with one flower, but a branch comes off and another branch and another branch. So here's a live panicle. You can see lots of branching. And here's a live spike. And again, you'll find out later what these two are. Here, are the, as I said, the flowers are arranged directly attached to the stem in a vertical axis. A few more terms. If you go to the end of one of these branches, or if you just go along the stem of your spike here, you'll find a structure that looks like this. It's a bunch of scales, a whole bunch of scales. And inside these scales, if you pull it apart, you'll find the flowers. I call this in the book to avoid technical terminology. I call this a flower cluster because that's what it is. It's a cluster of flowers, but the technical term is a spikelet. And in the course of this talk, I'm gonna use the technical and the plain English terms sort of back and forth. Um, the term spikelet is not ridiculous. If you look at our spike here, the flowers are all attached to the axis, attached to the stem in a vertical axis. Inside this flower cluster, you can't see it, but there's a little stalk in here that the flowers are attached to. 
So it's like a spike. It's, it's flowers attached directly to the stem in a vertical axis, but it's little. So it's a spikelet, kind of cute. So here's an individual flower. This is what you would find in here. As you can see, grass flowers are very simple, no frills, just the basic parts for reproduction. In the book, I call it a flower because that's what it is. The technical term, again, a little cute, is a floret. Floret, because it's a small flower. Here are the male parts, the stamens, and I've purposely drawn them sticking way far out because that's what grasses have to do when they're ready to flower. Grasses are as visually uninteresting to insects as they are to us, they're wind pollinated. So the stamens have to stick way far out in order for the pollen to be spread on the wind. And if you have hay fever, I apologize, they have to produce a lot of pollen because wind pollination is basically random. So these are the stamens, there are usually three of them, not always, but usually three. Here are the female parts. Here's the ovary. Here are the styles, they're very short. And here are the stigmas, they're feathery to catch the pollen. And they're usually two. So that is the basics of the flower. Each ovary has one ovule, one egg cell. And when it gets fertilized, it becomes a hard, a little hard dry thing that we would call a seed. Technically it's a fruit um, in the book. I just figured that doesn't make sense to a lot of people for this little hard dry thing to be called a fruit. So I call it a grain. Okay. If you've tried to identify grasses on your own, you might've come across these terms, lemma, palea, glooms. These are the terms that begin to make people nervous. So I'll explain them, but I wanna stress that if you don't really wanna learn about them and, and they're confusing you, you don't really need to understand them for the purposes of this talk. We'll be using a lot of plain English vocabulary as well. But let's start with the lemmas. If you paid close attention when I told you that the flowers were inside these scales, you might've noticed that I was only circling around these upper scales, not these lower two. These are the lemmas here. And these two, the lower ones, are the glooms. They have no flowers. Sometimes they're called sterile scales. And you can see this difference if you take a spikelet or a flower cluster and hold it up to the light. So here you'll see nothing. And then inside the rest of the scales, in, for instance, in this case, these little scratches are the undeveloped flowers. And then when the seeds are ripe, when the grains are ripe, you'll see little brown dots. So that can help you tell which are the glooms, the sterile scales, and which are the, the lemmas, the fertile scales. Subtending each flower under each flower is the lemma and the palea. They're both scales, still more kinds of scales. Here I've drawn the lemma a little bigger, but that's not always the case. The lemmas are the ones you see here on the outside. The paleas can be hard to see. Sometimes they're thin and translucent, and sometimes they do a tricky thing, which is to fold themselves inside the lemma. They're still on one side or the other of the, of the flower, but, but as I said, they can be hard to see. So don't, don't worry about them too much. Um, before I go to this photograph, I just wanna say that these drawings are highly generalized, highly stylized. And this is sort of your basic model of a spikelet, but there are a lot of variations on this theme, some of which you'll see as we go on. So let's just look at these different parts on a live flower. Here's a spikelet with several flowers. Here are the two sterile scales, the glooms. You can see they don't always look hugely different from the others. Here are some flowers, some florets. Here's a lemma, a little hard to see, but these are all lemmas here. Here are this, this, here's the stigma, it's in flower here. And this little tiny, tiny, tiny translucent thing is the palea. And here are the stamens hanging down, casting their pollen. One more set of terms have to do with the leaves. Grass leaves are a little different from other plants. They have two parts. The part that sticks out that we would call the leaf is called the blade. Then the leaf continues wrapping around the stem where it's called the sheath. In all plants, the, the point where the leaf joins the stem is the node. And since this is part of the leaf, the node is down here at the base and it forms a little bulge. And I'm going over this because it's important to understand these distinctions when you start using the technical keys. You might see something in the key that says stem fuzzy. And you might look at this instead and think this is the stem and it's not fuzzy. So you, you make the wrong choice. 
Or you might see a case that says ring of hairs at the node, and you might think this is the node and you see no ring of hairs, so you make the wrong choice, but the node is down here. So just keep that in mind when you're using the technical books. Okay, let's go for a walk and look at some grasses. You're not gonna have to go very far because unless you live in the deep dark woods, the ones I'm gonna show you tonight are species that grow all around you, all around you, in the, and especially if you're living in a suburban environment, um, they're all along roadsides, fields, meadows, waste ground, vacant lots, very, very common. I have 13 of them tonight to show you, a baker's dozen. So we'll start with this one, Poa pretensis, Kentucky bluegrass. If you have a lawn and you stop mowing it, this is what, we'll, what it will look like because this is one of the most widespread lawn grasses. So how do we recognize it? The first thing you should look at is the inflorescence. And you can see it's a panicle with lots of branching. And it's, a, it's got a pyramidal shape wider at the bottom. Unfortunately for tonight, that characteristic is not going to help us very much because a lot of the ones that we're looking at tonight have the pyramidal panicle. Another really obvious difference that you can sometimes use to tell one grass from another is size. This is medium size, two to three feet, but unfortunately that's not gonna help us much tonight either because a lot of the ones we're gonna look at are medium size. So we have to go into some detail. We're gonna look at the spikelets first. Here's a spikelet or the flower cluster. Here are the two empty scales. These are the florists. They're a little plumper. That's another way you can tell the glooms from the, from the flower scales. And you'll see there are several scales in the spikelet. Not all grasses have several, several, I mean, several flowers, excuse me. Not all grasses have several flowers in the spikelet. Unfortunately, that's not gonna help us much tonight either because a lot of the ones we're gonna look at have several flowers per spikelet. So we really have to get into some detail here and we're gonna look at one flower. This is the lemma. It's tan now because it's finished. But what you're gonna look at, and you can see this with your naked eye, you really can, is these cobwebby hairs at the base of the flower. That's the best word for them, cobwebby hairs. A lot of grass genera have hairs at the base of the flower, but none of them have this curly, sticky texture like this. There are a lot of species of poa in our area, and not all of them have the cobwebby hairs, but if you find the cobwebby hairs, you know it's in the genus Poa. So that's one little trick that will help you. The next part of the plant that will help us atypically is the leaves. And I say atypically because generally the leaves are the last part of the grass plant that you would look at for help. One of the characteristics of the grass family is long, narrow leaves with parallel veins to which I could add long, narrow, alternate, entire leaves with parallel veins. There's very little variation among leaves in the grass family. But here is something that can help us. I hope you can see this. At the tip of the leaf, it looks like the prow of a canoe. I hope you believe me. It's called the boat-shaped leaf tip. And that is characteristic of all species of poa, the boat-shaped leaf tip. Here's another one with a pyramidal panicle. Looks somewhat like Poa, somewhat different. Meadow ryegrass. When I wrote the first edition of my book, this plant was called Festuca elatior, meadow fescue. It's had a lot of names. Then it became Shedanoris pretensis. Some sources now call it Lolium pretensi. For the purposes of this talk, since I called it Shedanoris in the book, I'm gonna call it Shedanoris tonight, meadow ryegrass. So how do we tell this apart from Poa pretensis? It's got the same kind of pyramidal panicle. And if we look at the spikelet, an individual spikelet, you'll see there are lots of flowers per spikelet, but there are quite a few easy ways to tell it apart. First, if we compare the spikelets, here's Poa pretensis. You can see it's kind of plump compared to Shedanoris. The spikelet is, is longer and narrower. And then if we count the flowers here, which you, you can do with your naked eye, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven flowers per spikelet. Here we have one, two, three, there could be as many as five, but there are fewer. So that's one way to start telling them apart. Also, of course, you're not gonna find the boat-shaped boat -shaped leaf tip in Shedanoris, nor are you going to find the cobwebby hairs 
And the leaves can help us a little bit. As I said, you won't find the bow-shaped leaf tip. The Shedonora's leaves, to my mind, are much longer and narrower, more spear-like, more pointed at the end. And then here's another clue. Here's a dried up leaf. This sort of channel here is where the stem would have been. And here is where the blade joins the stem. So this is the blade, this is the sheath. And at the base of the blade, I hope you can see them, there's a little bump. There are actually two, one on each side, little bulges. Those are character characteristic of this species, Chetonorus pretensis. If you want the technical word for these little bumps, they're called oracles, A-U-R-I-C-L-E-S, and that's Latin for little ears. Chetonorus is generally a lot coarser than Poa, and I can tell you that from my own experience because I have a lot of it in my lawn. I have a tiny lawn, I mow it with a hand, I mean hand, human powered mower, and I really don't like this Chetonorus at all. It's very coarse and hard to mow. Now, again, if you have sharp eyes, here's the inflorescence of Chetonorus, and you might've noticed that it's quite different from this inflorescence, excuse me, quite different from this inflorescence. This one is open and this one is closed. So this is the time to tell you about a difficult trick that the grasses have, some of the grasses, the ones that have their inflorescences and panicles. These are drawings from my book. This is Shedonoris here. This is before flowering. You'll often find it closed. Here it is open when it's in flower. When it's finished flowering, sometimes it closes up again, sometimes it stays open. This is red top bent grass. We'll see this later, same thing. Before flowering, it's closed. It opens up during flowering. After flowering, sometimes it closes, sometimes it doesn't. Here's Poa pretensis, same idea. Much more closed before flowering than opens up during flowering. Again, it has to just spread the pollen around, closes up again after flowering. And this can be difficult because a lot of the keys, including even mine, Sometimes they ask you if the, if the panicle is narrow or if it's open. And if you find it at this stage, you, you could certainly be misled. Um, there's not really an easy way around it, but one, but except just to be aware of it. But another way to, to sort of avoid this problem is to collect several specimens when you're collecting, because you're bound to find some that are more advanced than another. I'm gonna talk later about good collecting practices, but one of them is, is to collect several specimens um, so that you're not stuck with one that might be atypical. So just keep that in mind. I sort of apologize. The bright side of all of this is that a lot of these grasses keep their inflorescences long after flowering, for months after flowering. So you don't have to catch the grasses at the minute they're in flower, the way you do with, with quote unquote, other wildflowers. So there is a bright side to it. Another pyramidal panicle, broader at the base, Bromus inermis, Smooth brome, onless brome grass, also called Hungarian brome. So how are we gonna tell this from the other two we've seen so far? And I'll, I'll tell you now that for each species, I'm gonna show you the inflorescence and then the spikelets and then talk about other characteristics as necessary. But here are the spikelets. Here are the two empty scales at the base. Here are the florets. And you can see here, again, there are several flowers per spikelet. So again, we have to look at other characteristics. But if we compare the spikelets of these three, I think you could see some pretty clear differences. The spikelets, flower clusters, whichever you want to call them, a smooth brome, are very long and narrow. And here, Poa pretensis is sort of, sort of wide and plump. Shedonorus, long and narrow, but much thicker, much thicker than those of Bromus inermis. Another pyramidal panicle. I told you a lot of them look alike. Hocus linatus, velvet grass. So let's look at the spikelet. You'll see this is kind of different from the drawing I showed you earlier. And I told you there's quite a bit of variation. Here are the two empty scales, the glooms, and you can see they're bigger than the whole spikelet. If they were closed, you wouldn't even see these florets here, as opposed to these two where the glooms are much, much smaller and you can see the florets. So those are the glooms, the empty scales. Here's one flower, and it, it's hard to see in this picture, but it's a perfect flower, it has male and female parts. This flower, 
if you had a, mag a, a dissecting scope, you would see it only has stamens. It's a stamina flower. So you might be looking at this and thinking, uh, this is getting a little complicated and these florets are tiny. We're talking millimeters here. But in the case of this species, you don't have to worry about the, the florets or the glooms or the spikelets or anything one little bit, because all you need to do is look at the stem, the sheath and the blades, and you'll see these little hairs, run your hands along it. It feels exactly like velvet, hence velvet grass. This is a good time to stop for a minute and talk about good identification practices. The best place to identify things is probably in the field. But if you're like me, you might not like to do things standing up and maybe you don't wanna sit down in a tick infested meadow or a swampy, a boggy swamp. So you take a specimen home to key it out in comfort. You might just grab this and run home. That is called top snatching top snatching. Top snatching is exactly what it sounds like. You just take the top part of the plant and run home. And velvet grass is a prime example of why that's a self-destructive practice, because if you had only had this and then started looking at these spikelets, you could have gotten pretty frustrated. But if you had brought home some of the stem and the leaves, you would know ex immediately what the plant is. So this is the first thing I want to say. Don't just bring home the inflorescence. Bring home parts of the stem, the leaves, the sheaths, especially the basil leaves are important. And ideally, I, I sometimes hesitate to say this, but ideally you should bring the home the whole plant roots and all. I don't, I don't love to tell people to be digging up plants all the time, especially if you have the slightest suspicion that your plant is rare or native. Um, if it's really, really common, go ahead and dig it up, but maybe you don't even want to. But if you don't do that, this is important too, is take a look at the growth form of the plant. By growth form, I'm referring to traits like whether or not it spreads by rhizomes or whether it grows in isolated tufts. Are the leaves all along the stem or leaves only at the base of the stem? Does it sprawl along on the ground or does it grow upright? These are very helpful characteristics. And of course, you should note the habitat and the size. All of these can be diagnostic and make your life easier. This is still velvet grass. I'm showing you this slide just because it's a great example of what I was talking about earlier about the changes that the panicle goes through during its life cycle. These are the same species, velvet grass. They could even be from the same plant. But here before flowering, you can see how contracted it is, different color as well. And it opens up during flowering. Sometimes stays open, sometimes doesn't. Another pyramidal panicle. Red top bent grass, Agrasis gigantea. Let's look at the spikelets, the flower clusters. Here's a flower cluster. Here are the two empty scales. And here's a flower or a floret. And you might be saying, well, where are the rest of them? There are no more because this is a one flowered spikelet. The picture that I showed you, the drawings I showed you, there were several flowers in each flower cluster but there are many, many genera that only have one flower per flower cluster. And sometimes people get confused. They say, well, you know, how can it be a, a spikelet if it only has one flower? The answer is in the glooms. The glooms define the spikelet. So this is one flower cluster, one flower, one spikelet, one flower cluster, excuse me. But again, these are tiny. We're talking millimeters with all of these things. And maybe you don't wanna to try to see these characteristics. So let's look at the plant as a whole, look at the inflorescence. And I think you can see that it's kind of shiny and very delicate and wispy. And if you could run your fingers along these branches, they'd have a silky texture. And then this is where it gets its name, red top bent grass, the name is no accident. This is a little gone by, but I hope you can see it has a reddish purplish color. And if you see a whole, a whole field of this grass, red top bent grass, I know it's not native, but it is, it's quite beautiful in my opinion, very beautiful. One last way you can tell it apart from the other ones we've been looking at has to do with timing. I told you that these are grasses that flower in mid to late May, but this one actually comes out quite a bit later. Up here in Connecticut, for me, it doesn't come out till late June, quite a bit later than the others. But the color and the silky texture and the delicate texture will do a lot for you.
So here are these first five, quick review. Poa pertensis, Kentucky bluegrass, cobwebby hairs, boat-shaped leaf tip, Shedonorus pertensis, meadow ryegrass, very coarse, little bulges at the base of the blade, spear-like leaves, smooth brome, long, narrow spikelets, velvet grass, Holcus linatus, velvety texture, that's all you need to know on the leaves, blades, and sheaths, and red top bent grass, Agrassa gigantea, very delicate, delicate and wispy. So those are the first five. Those are the ones that look the most alike. We're gonna move on now to some that are a little more distinctive on their own. Arena theorem eladius, tall oats grass. The name is no accident. It is taller than all of these others. And if you see it in a meadow, it'll be towering above the others. But let's look at the spikelets and then go back to the, the more naked eye characteristics. Actually, these are flowers, individual flowers, not spikelets. You see a little tuft of hairs at the base. I told you lots of other genera have hairs, but they're not cobwebby like those of Poa. They're straight and stiff. And then most importantly, you see this bristle, which comes out and then makes the 90 degree turn. And you can see the bristles here, even without taking anything apart. They're very easy to see, all these little bristles. So you can tell it by its height, by the bristles, and then it has a, a shininess about it. It's, a, it's shiny and silvery, more so than the others. Tall oats grass, arena theorem, eladius. Here's another one with a very tall, narrow panicle. Phalaris arundinacea, reed canary grass. Some of you are probably cringing or crying just at the sight of it because this is a terrible invader in wetland. It's, and it spreads by tough, thick rhizomes. I've sometimes been in, in wet, wetlands where I see just a little bit of it and I think, oh, I'm gonna pull it out and nip it in the bud. Not so easy, not so easy. Very thick, tough rhizomes. Here it is in flower. Here it is past flowering. Um, it's, the flowers are in a panicle like the others, but you can see it's not pyramidal, not pyramidal. It's just straight and narrow and much longer than the others. Here is one flower cluster, one spikelet. And again, this only has one flower, sort of unusual, but well, not unusual, but different from some of the others. And again, you don't have to worry about these spikelets because there are a lot of other ways to recognize it. One is in the leaves, atypically. These leaves are wider than the leaves of most grasses that you see. I don't know if you're convinced from the photograph, but they are wider. And here's the whole plant. It's taller than a lot of the others. And you can see how the inflorescence is very narrow. Even in flower when it opens, it's still a lot narrow, long and narrow. It usually grows in wetlands, but not always. I found some once on a, in a rocky outcrop in a cemetery. And I found some a little while ago growing in a, a pasture on top of a hill. And this was sort of a sad situation. It was part of a town owned open space. And there was a beautiful floodplain, still is a beautiful floodplain down in the valley. The town was leasing the pasture to a farmer and the farmer planted reed canary grass in the pasture. Uh, very unfortunate. So I think that floodplain will be affected in the future. I think you can tell that this is quite different from the others we've been looking at. And we're in a different habitat too, still Still disturbed areas, roadsides, but this plant, Bromus tectorum, downy chest, cheat grass, really favors the, the horrible soil, the, the very dry areas, sand, it even likes beaches. You'll find it in the worst areas. Um, the flowers are still in a panicle. Here are all the branches, lots of branches. And these are the spikelets. There are still several flowers per spikelet, several flowers per flower cluster. But there are lots of easy ways to identify this. We'll look at the individual flowers here. These are individual flowers, and you'll see that each one has this long bristle. The technical word for bristle is on, which is actually shorter than the, the non-technical word, but it has a long bristle, and you can see the bristles here, even with your naked eye. Before it flowers, when it's still green, the bristles hang down straight, and then after it's flowered, they stick out at 90 degree angles. So it's very easy to spot downy chest, cheat grass. Finally, very easy to recognize, the branches droop, unlike any of the others that we've seen, the branches droop. 
And as if all these characteristics aren't enough to help you recognize it, pull it up, just give it the slightest little tug and the whole thing will come out of the ground. That's because it's an annual. All the other ones we've seen so far have been perennials. Annuals have very short root systems because they need to invest all of their energy into producing flowers and seeds. They only live for one year. If they don't make a lot of seeds, the species will die out. So for, usually annuals have very short root systems. It's not only an annual, but it's a winter annual. This is a, a different kind of life cycle. It germinates in the fall, spreads, spends the winter in, in this vegetative form. And then when the weather warms up, it's ready to go. It starts flowering right away. I took this picture in November. I was on a walk one day. I saw all these green leaves. And I, was, I thought, oh, how wonderful, something green in November. Isn't that wonderful? I wonder what it is. Well, I looked around and saw these dead stalks of the downy chest and I was not quite so enchanted anymore. And here's a picture of it along the roadside. This is on the Eastern shore where it's a little sandier. And I put this in to show you the height, which also makes it different from the others we've seen so far because it's quite short. It's maybe about ankle high or maybe a foot at the most. And here it is green before it flowers and then it turns tan and sometimes a, a, a wine red after it's flowering. We're finished with the panicles. Here's a species that has its flower clusters in a spike. They're attached directly to the stem on a vertical axis. Elemis repens, formerly called agropyrin repens, creeping wild rye, often called quack grass. So how do you recognize it? You can see the spikelets are, are big. They're much bigger than the others. You can see this is almost a, a centimeter, much bigger than the others we've been looking at. And you can make out the individual flower clusters. They're not all mushed together like the others. And, and they go in this alternating pattern with some of the stem actually even showing between them. Here's one flower cluster, one spikelet. Here are the empty scales, the glooms. There are several flowers. And here are the glooms stretched out. I included this picture because there's another species that looks quite a bit like quack grass. People confuse them quite a bit. Lolium perenni, perennial ryegrass. You can see it has these same flattened flower clusters, flattened spikelets. It goes in the same alternating zigzag pattern. So there are three ways to tell these two species apart, two genera actually. I'm gonna start with the most difficult way. And that has to do with the glooms, the empty scales. On Lolium perenni, here's a gloom, an empty scale. These are all flower scales, all flowers. They're a little fatter. And before I showed you that stylized flower that had two glooms, two empty scales at the base. So you look over here for the other one and you're not gonna find it because there's only one. Another variation on that spikelet theme that we talked about earlier. Here's the quack grass. You can see it has two glooms, but the perennial rye grass only has one. That's not always easy to see, however, not always easy to see. So here's another way you can tell them apart. And here I'm, I'm gonna demonstrate with my hands in a minute. Um, we don't often think about front, back or sides when we talk about grass flower clusters, but it's important here. Here's Lolium perenni, here's the front, and it's the side that faces the stem. The side faces the stem. In Elemis repens, the back faces the stem, the flat part, the back faces the stem. I am now shamelessly going to take a page from Kevin Dodge's talk. And let me just get this organized a minute here. No, that's not gonna work. I can't see myself, so I hope this is working. Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit. Think of the stem as a pole and think of my hands as the flowers. So the front of my hands are the front of the flower clusters. The palms are the back of the flower clusters. And if this is lolium, my thumbs are the glooms. So here's lolium. My little fingers are the sides and they go up the stem like this with the sides facing the stem. I hope you can see it. Here's Elemis repens. The palms of my hands are the backs. We're not gonna worry about the glooms and they go up the stem like this. So I hope that helps. I hope you could see it. But if that 
isn't totally clear to you, there's a very easy way to tell them apart. Elemis repens. Repens means creeping, creeping wild rye. They don't call it that for nothing. If you have it in your garden, you probably don't like it. You pull it up and immediately you've got all these creeping rhizomes going in every direction. Lolium perenni does not have creeping rhizomes. It just has a short fibrous root system. Lolium perenni is often planted where there's bare soil. People use it when they put in a new lawn and they use it for cover. Um, you'll see it along roadsides if some work has been done and, and they need, and again, they want to stabilize the soil. It does not have these rhizomes. It has a short fibrous root system. And it's more delicate than quack grass. Here's another spike, Timothy, sort of a classic spike. There are lots of flowers here directly attached to the stem on a vertical axis. Here is one flower cluster, one spikelet. These are the two empty scales, the glooms. And you might be saying, well, well, where is the flower? <laughs> there is none. There's only one and it's hidden inside here. You don't have to worry too much about these details because this long cylindrical spike is pretty, pretty, pretty diagnostic. However, I would like to say there's nothing that looks like Timothy. There is one other genus. It's called Allopicurus, A-L-O-P-E-C-U-R-U-S, meadow foxtail. Timothy grows in uplands. If you're in a damp spot or along the edge of a river and you think you're seeing Timothy, Chances are you're not. Chances are you're seeing meadow foxtail. I don't have a picture of it because it's not nearly as common as Timothy is. Um, there are a couple of ways to tell it apart, partly the habitat, but also if you were to rub your fingers along a spike of meadow foxtail, it would have a silky, smooth, silky texture, whereas Timothy is rough. Also, meadow foxtail has little bristles sticking out horizontally, which you won't find on Timothy. Um, Timothy is often planted for hay. I think horses are quite fond of it, but like all the rest of these, and they're all non-native, it has since spread to roadsides and similar places. Here, we might think we're looking at another spike, but unfortunately, life is not always simple in the botanical world. If you start pulling this apart, you'll find little branches, short branches, and with more branches. Technically, it's a panicle. However, even the professional botanists are a little flummoxed by this, and they refer to it as a spike-like panicle. So that's quite a good, good symptom of indecision. Sweet vernal grass, anthoxanthum odoratum. How do we recognize it? How do we distinguish it from Timothy? Well, you can see the spike is tapered at each end. Oh, excuse me. Pointed at the end, tapered. It's also quite a bit shorter than the, the spike of Timothy. Um, I'm going to show you the spikelet, but it's certainly not something you need to worry about. This is highly unusual, much more unusual than any of the others I've shown you. Um, these are the two empty scales, the glooms. These are lemmas. It's very convenient that this is labeled because sometimes I even lose track of what's going on here. These are lemmas, but they have no flowers. They're sterile lemmas. That's sort of a contradiction in terms, but that's what they are. And then if you got this when it was actually in flower or took it from a live plant, this whole thing would be hidden inside these two sterile lemmas. It's a tiny little floret, a fertile flower. Here's the lemma, here's the palea, here are the stamens. And if you think back to the drawing that we had a long time ago, there were three stamens. This one only has two. Here's the, the stigma sticking out here. So this is a very unusual flower cluster, but it's tiny. You don't need to worry about it because any of the characteristics I've shown you pale in comparison to the most obvious characteristic of this plant. It tastes good. When I was a kid, as Anne told you, I used to roam around a lot by myself and for some reason decided I wanted to chew on some grasses. And I instinctively learned to recognize this one. It does have a very sweet flavor. If you don't feel like chewing on a grass, um, just walk through a field of it or crush it in your, in your fingers and you'll get that sweet smell. It's not so sweet when it's overtaking a rare species. This is sundial lupin, which I understand is listed in your state. And here it's being overtaken by sweet vernal grass and also by velvet grass. This is the last. I saved the easiest for last. Dactylus glomerata, 
orchard grass. It's technically a panicle, but you can see it's quite different from all the others we've seen with these short, stiff branches, short, stiff branches. And then the flowers are in these bunches. The Latin name will help you in both respects. Dactylus is like your, your finger, like a pterodactyl. Glomerata obviously means in bunches, glom together. Here's a spikelet, a flower cluster. These are the empty scales, the glooms. And here are the flowers. This is more typical, like the drawing we saw in the beginning with several flowers in the flower cluster. But all you need to see is these short, stiff branches and these flowers and clusters. Non-native, like all the rest of them. Perennial, like all of them except the Bromus tectorum. Very common, like all the rest of them. So here we go. We've seen the 13. We'll have another quick review. And then I'm going to tell you what to do if you find something that is not in the book. But let's go. Poa pretensis, Kentucky bluegrass, cobwebby hairs, boat-shaped leaf tip, Shedonorus pretensis, coarse, little bulges where the blade meets the stem, long pointed leaves, bromus inermis, smooth brome, long, narrow, pointed spikelets, flower clusters, velvet grass, also a pyramidal panicle, but with the velvety leaves blades and sheaths, red top, red top bent grass, Agrostis gigantea, shiny, smooth, silky, tall oak grass, a narrow panicle. I neglected to say that earlier, but it's a, a no, more narrow panicle than the others, taller than the others, shiny with little bristles. Reed canary grass, another tall, narrow panicle, mainly growing in wetlands, thick, tough rhizomes, wide leaves, Bromus tectorum, downy chest, drooping branches, bristles, annual growth habit, Elemis repens, crack grass, flattened spikelets with space between them, creeping rhizomes, lolium perenni, perennial ryegrass, flower clusters with their sides toward the stem, shallow fibrous root system, no creeping rhizomes, Timothy, Flium pretensi has this cigar shaped spike. Sweet vernal grass, Anthoxanthum odoratum has the tapered spike and the nice taste, the nice smell. And orchard grass has the short, stiff branches with the flowers in bunches. When I wrote my book, I wanted to keep things simple and I wanted it to be approachable. So, one of the ways I did that was to limit the number of species. There in Connecticut alone, there are over 200 species of grasses in the United States, maybe 14, 1500 species, Northeastern United States, maybe who knows, four to 500 species. If I had included every grass, sedge, or rush in the area, the book would have been overwhelming. So, to keep it simple, as I said, I only included the common species. What this means is that if you're interested in grasses and you keep exploring and finding more species, sooner or later, you might find one that is not in the book. So what do you do? Well, first you go to this section at the end of the book that is called, if you do not find something in this book. And I have a glossary, hopefully in plain English, illustrations explaining the terms that you will find in the technical manuals, because that's what you're gonna to have to do. You're gonna to have to go to the technical manuals at that point. So this section, I hope will give you some help. And these are some resources that I would recommend. First Book of Grasses by Agnes Chase. This was written in 1922, almost a century ago. So you might have trouble finding the original edition, but a revised edition came out in 1977 with basically the same text. I told you how there are a lot of variations on the theme of spikelets. And believe me, there are a whole lot more different ones that we haven't seen at all. You'll find a lot of spikelets, a lot of flower clusters that don't look anything like the ones we've seen before. These variations fall into groups. And this is where this book will help you because Agnes Chase has a chapter on each group with illustrations and she explains, this is the gloom, these are the lemmas, these are the paleas. Very, very helpful. Not a book you wanna sit down and read, but one you will refer to. And I should say also, as I said, it was written in 1922, almost a century ago. In her day, there were no emojis. There were no smiley faces. It was not the age of instant gratification. 
So you have to take this book slowly and read it carefully. And if you do, it will help you a lot. How to Identify Grasses and Grass-Like Plants by H.D. Harrington. Fabulous book. It has a lot of illustrations, a great glossary with any term you would ever want to find. It also discusses the sedges and the rushes, the grass-like plants. Excellent book. So these are both reference books. When you get to the actual identification, I'm told this is your go-to book, The Floor of Virginia. And I understand you also have it on an app, which is very nice. And then if you want a portable book, book for the field, only devoted to grasses, here's one just for you, just for your region. Field Guide to Grasses of the Mid-Atlantic by Sarah Chamberlain from Penn State. It's very approachable. So before I finish, I just wanna thank some people. Um, when the quarantine first started and I figured out about Zoom that I could listen to lectures from all over the country, I checked out a lot of volunteer botanical groups and very few of them had a lecture series as well organized and high quality as yours. And it's not an accident. It's because of these hardworking people behind the scenes. I very much appreciate the help you gave, they gave me and I hope you appreciate their hard work as well. I also wanna thank the many photographers whose pictures you saw. Um, these photographers are not only immensely talented, but also very generous. Some of them giving me direct permission and a lot of them posting their pictures on the internet for the world to use, which is a wonderful thing. And finally, I wanna thank all of you for your attention. I hope you learned something about grasses. I hope you'll enjoy the grasses in the upcoming spring, summer, and fall. And I thank you for listening. And many thanks to you, Lauren, for a very informative and clear and accessible presentation. Our audience has a number of questions for you. And the first one is, do you have any tips to distinguish reed canary grass from switchgrass before flowering? By switchgrass, um, I'm... Switchgrass to me is Panicum virgatum, which would be very, very different and wouldn't be growing in a wet place. I wonder if you're maybe talking this, I don't know if the questioner can, can give me the scientific name for the, the species they're talking about. Maybe um, there's a witch, you know, common names are problematic. Um, there's a witchgrass that's an annual that grows in the late summer. Um, the person who asked this question, if you know the scientific name, type it in the chat, or if you have any other identification clues. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay. Panicum virgatum? Panicum? Virgatum, okay. So they, you want to know how to tell that apart from reed canary grass? Before flowering. Okay, there are lots of ways. First of all, habitat. I read um, panic, well, yeah, around here, Panicum virgatum grows in dry habitats, sandy soil, roadsides. Um, it grows on the upper edges of salt marshes, but I've, I've never seen it in a freshwater wetland. Also, yeah, before flowering, because <laughs> yeah, the flower, the inflorescences are quite different, but before flowering, um, well, the growth form, because reed canary grass spreads by rhizomes and switchgrass grows in. in dense tufts with fibrous roots, which um, it, it's, a, it's very hard to, to dig up, but it doesn't spread by rhizomes. Uh, next question. What grasses were here in Maryland 500 years ago, and are those native grasses still here? Since you're in Connecticut, you may not know, but if you do, you can comment. Yep, and I wasn't here 500 years ago either. Um, but it's a very good question. And especially in the spring, the, the native grasses are going to be few and far between. You'll find them mainly in the woods. In the summer and fall, the native grasses become a lot more prevalent. Uh, yeah, Maryland, I would have a hard time answering that. And, and maybe someone in the audience would, would want to share. Um, up north, there's a Calamagrasis canadensis, which is native, which would have been quite common actually in, in beaver meadows. It comes in the openings in beaver meadows. Um, some, your, some of your grasses like Casmanthium, the, you know, the woodland sea oats or whatever it's called, that might've been around. 
uh, the, the, the fall grasses, I'm sure would have been there, like the little blue stem, the broom sedge, um, especially in open areas. So, you know, that, that's the other question too, were there many open areas or were there not? That's a, a larger question. Um, purple top, Tridens flavus, is very common down your way. Again, grows in open areas. Um, so those are some of the native grasses that I assume would have been there 500 years ago. But as I said, I wasn't there and I don't live in Maryland. Um, someone has mentioned that several of the species you talked about have uh, pretensis or similar in the species name. What does that word mean? Oh, fields, grows in fields. So that, that's, and it, it makes sense because a lot of these do grow in fields. Good question. Is there anything we can do about iNaturalist using less common English names for grasses, such as meadow grass instead of bluegrass, Edinburgh mm. fog instead of velvet grass? The mm. iNat system seems to go its own way in regards to common names. Interesting question. I'm afraid I cannot help you. Um, iNaturalist is, is a wonderful website. I. You know, you, the first edition of my book was written in 1979. You can do a little math and probably guess that I don't use it as much as maybe some younger people do. So I'm afraid I can't help you with that. Um, one person says, I thought orchard grass leaves had a unique feature like flatten or something like that. Yes, yes, the, the, leaf, the sheaths, um, where the sheath joins the stem or you know, down at the base, um, it is flattened. And you can even identify them when they're not in flower, they grow in clumps and they're sort of blue green. And yes, they, they will be somewhat flattened, yes. Since these European grasses have been here for so long, really for centuries, have insects been able to transition and start using them to lay eggs? for larva to feed on their leaves, or are the grasslands of these species really ecological deserts that provide no insect food for birds and other animals? I wish I could answer that authoritatively. I'm, I'm pretty sure that quite a few of them do provide larval food. Um, there's an excellent website, Wildflowers of Illinois, and he talks about you know, what grasses are, are for any plant. He talks about the different invertebrates that use them. And I, I think quite a few of them do. How do you tell the difference between reed canary grass and rice cut grass? <laughs> Go into the wetland wearing shorts. You'll know immediately. I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, rice cut grass doesn't get its name by accident. Um, if you do wander into a wetland wearing shorts, you will know it immediately and you will never go into a wetland wearing shorts again. Um, the leaves have very, very sharp prickers on the edge. It's, it's a wicked species. I've seen pictures of people with blood on their legs from, right, from rice cut grass. Also, right, rice cut grass is smaller, much smaller than reed canary grass. And the inflorescence is wider. It's, it's more pyramidal. It's more delicate. Um, those, those are the main differences. And it's a more pale green, similar habitats, but quite different. And we have a question about sedges. Are yeah. most of our sedges native? Yes, yes. There, there are very few non-native sedges in the area. Um, I read about one recently, which is a, a new arrival, Carex flacca, I think it's called, F-L-A-C-C-A which is actually becoming invasive, which is very unusual for the sedges. It grows in wetlands, and I, I think it's more common down your way. But overall, most of the sedges around here are native. Well, we and, have and a comment you. about iNaturalist. Uh, Margaret Chatham says she always figured, since iNaturalist is worldwide, that they use the common name where the plant was native. So our invasive grasses get the names used wherever they came from. And someone else would like to know whether you have a favorite grass. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I sort of wondered if somebody might ask me that. Um, like children, 
<laughs> you don't want to choose a favorite, but I'll tell you a few of them. Switchgrass, I just, I love. Um, it's, it's very common up here. That's one, uh, Tridens flavus. And by switchgrass, by the way, I mean Panicum virgatum. Uh, Tridens flavus, purple top. Um, I'm not overly fond of any of these non-native spring grasses that I've told you about. Um, but those are two of my favorites, switchgrass and purple top. Uh, do you have a grass, a native grass, that you would recommend to replace lesser celandine in a stream bed? Ooh, that is an interesting question. Um, up here, the most common native grass that we see in wetlands is Glyceria striata. Um, I, I can't even remember the common name, I'm sorry, but Glyceria striata. But it's not, I mean, I don't think of it as a tough competitor and lesser celandine is so invasive and so difficult to get rid of. Um, I, you, well, you could try rice cut grass too, um, but I, I, that, that would be quite a challenge in my opinion. If anyone else in the audience has any ideas, I'm sure they would be welcome. Um, and then actually, let me think, there are other, there are other native, um, I mean, there are other species of Glyceria that are native that grow in wetlands uh, and some, some other native Poa species that grow in wetlands. But um, something to outcompete lesser celandine, that, that would be a challenge. Another question is whether leaf sheets are a good way to identify grasses. That's an, that's an excellent question. The sheath in and of itself might not be so helpful. I think what you might be getting at is whether you can identify grasses in their vegetative state. And the sheath will be part of what you look at, but, but it's more detailed than that. Um, there's one little structure I didn't talk about at, at the base of the blade, on the inside of the blade. There's a, a little structure that to me looks like a hangnail. It's just a little translucent structure. It's called the ligule. L-I-G-U-L-E. And the ligules do vary. They're, they're tiny, they're millimeters, but they do vary from one species to another in their shape and their size. And so that's one thing you look at. And then you look at whether the, whether the sheath is open at the top or whether the, the edges of the sheath overlap. Um, but th this is not easy. I mean, the, the sheath and the, and the blade and the stem right, right around where, where they all come together um, are characteristics you use to identify grasses when they're not flowering, but it's, it's not easy. And there's a follow-up question about the lesser celandine, which is whether a sedge uh, would compete with it. Hmm, a wetland sedge. Another interesting question. It would depend, I don't know, uh, you know, I think what you need is something that spreads by rhizomes and there is um, K-Rex lasiocarpa, but I don't know if you have a lot of it down your way. It's a more Northern species. It can cover acres, acres and acres and acres. Um, and it needs sun. And then the other problem is that lesser celandine also grows in the shade. Um, this, this is something I've certainly never thought about. Uh, I, you know, and there are plenty of, of wetland sedges. Um, well, K-Rex stricta, the tussock sedge, that's an interesting possibility. You're, you're pushing the frontiers of invasive control here. Um, so maybe tusk sedge. That, that's a challenge. Thank you, everyone. And we'll say good night. Have a good evening. <laughs>